Yeah, it really is a pleasure to be here and to sort of follow such a wonderful session um, and, and the progress in multiple myeloma that you've heard about and will hear future um, in the next couple of sessions is in no small way related to investigators in Italy. So it is wonderful to be at the site of where much of the progress has emanated. Here are my disclosures. Um, I always like to start with this because um, over my now over 40 year career in myeloma, we went from no drugs approved uh, to as of uh, yesterday, 16 drugs approved. The bispecific T cell engager to Clistamab got approved yesterday. So we have 16 classes of drugs, 31 new treatments that weren't existent. And that's, as I've already said, it's a consequence of the development of in my opinion, models and understanding of the biology of the tumor and microenvironment like you've heard about and I'll expand on. But it's also the translation very quickly of that science to help patients improve diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. And so in my, I think what's happened in myeloma, and you'll all appreciate it, we've had three eras of progress. We had transplant that started in the 70s and 80s and has continued to be uh, improved. We had novel drugs from 2000 on, thalidomide and, and uh, started it along with bortezomib, but all the new agents. And then since around 2020, uh, we've had an immune revolution. And when you integrate those three, that's what's really underlied the progress. You've heard a beautiful talk about MR, uh, MRD from, uh, our, and how it could be used in Bologna um, as an example. But just to remind you that in this big meta-analysis, MRD really matters. We can argue whether it should be a goal of therapy in all patients, but it clearly does correlate with improved outcome. And so the idea, and you heard there's many trials that are ongoing to inform whether we need to change practice in order to get to MRD negativity. The reason it's even an issue is shown on this slide. It's just one of the many studies that are representative of this. But this is the Griffin trial, and it, re it compared DARA RVD um, versus RVD before and after transplant and uh, DARA R versus uh, R maintenance. But the point is, on the left-hand column, um, you can get 81% MRD negativity. Previously, we couldn't achieve MRD negativity, so it wasn't an issue. But now it is a, it, it's achievable and is uh, a, a realistic goal. You've already heard, and I agree totally with it, it's only half the problem. We actually have to deal with what's going on in the host besides the tumor. So what I'm going to try to do very quickly is to set, talk about targeting mechanisms that underlie how the microenvironment mediates growth, survival, drug resistance, and confers immunosuppression, starting from what we did before and thinking about the future and talk about how we can learn from the treatments we've already used, understanding new mechanisms of the image, proteasome inhibitors, even alkylating agents, talk about two or a couple of representative targets, epigenetic target um, in, the mic in tumors, uh, targeting protein uh, uh, synthesis or translation, and targeting the interaction between the tumor cell and microenvironment. I'm then going to talk about what I think is going to be the future of targeted drugs in myeloma. We haven't really been very successful. We have, we have uh, venetoclax, but I would argue we don't have much else. Are we going to get there or not? And then not going to talk about CAR-T or bites too much because you're going to hear beautiful talks totally devoted to that. But I will at least share some insights from our center on how I think we can use CARs and bites more readily and talk about combinations. So in any event, the first point I want to make is that um, I think this is the, the right, this is the wrong uh, talk anyway. <laughs> um, the, the first point I want to make is that, um, uh, that you've heard beautifully about um, the targeting the microenvironment uh, uh, characterizing the, the tumor, characterizing the microenvironment. But I asked a question, and I do want to bring up the concept of the interaction that occurs and, and really getting to the fundamental mechanisms that uh, underlie that interaction and so we can target its consequences. So at the International Myeloma uh, Workshop, Dr. Binder, who's from Mayo Clinic but working in our center, 
did some neat studies that were presented. So tumor cells were bound to stromal cells. Uh, and then before and after binding, he looked at RNA-seq and attack-seq and looked at the integration of uh, genomics and tried to look at the underlying chromatin accessibility, which consequently led to gene transcription signaling, et cetera, that was a consequence of the interaction. And he found many new genomic changes, usually due to distal enhancers. Um, there were, obviously, this resulted in highly enriched genes that were overexpressed. And the point is that um, these changes in the chromatin accessibility were correlated with the changes in gene expression. And he derived what's called an adverse stromal interaction uh, uh, index. That's shown on this slide. Certain genes went up, certain genes went down, and then he looked at a variety of clinical trials that we can, from IFM or from Arkansas, from the MMRF, from the um, EMC 92 uh, experience, but he looked and, and found that these actually, this stromal index actually correlated with outcome in all of these studies. Importantly, what he also found was that when you have cells bound to the stroma, you actually induce epigenetic changes and gene, as a consequence, um, expression uh, that mirrors what goes on in patients. So for example, on the left-hand side, these are plasma cells from a malignant pleural effusion on the right in the peripheral blood, but these are uh, gene signatures that were induced in a some myeloma cells when, bone marrow, when tumor cells bound to bone marrow. So it confers the ability of these cells to, to actually get to extramedullary sites. In my view, we really are going to need to profile uh, the, in this way as possible and think about an, inter an interactive index. I think Bruno's done some of this, but the point is, what is the consequence of the underlying mechanisms when a tumor interacts with the microenvironment? Now, we've already uh, talked about and we have targeted the microenvironment together with the novel agents. Over the last 20 years, we, for example, with bortezomib, knew, developed it to target the proteasome here, as shown at the bottom. But we already knew we were targeting mechanisms in the microenvironment. We knew that we were targeting bone biology by inhibiting osteoclasts. We knew that we were inhibiting the interaction by down-regulating adhesion molecules both on the tumor and in the microenvironment. So although we went forward targeting protein homeostasis in the tumor, we were targeting the microenvironment and we continued to learn uh, from our clinical experience what in fact is the ultimate important outcome. Speaking of that, Anna Maria Gula, who's returned uh, to Italy uh, and is, in my view, one of the rising stars in myeloma, um, you're lucky to have her back, um, has recently shown that bortezomib actually has activities that we didn't previously appreciate. This shows you that bortezomib triggers apoptotic myeloma cells expressing damps, or calreticulum in this case, in a, in a dose-dependent way, that in fact the apoptotic myeloma cells are taken up by dendritic cells. This triggers an immune response as shown in number three, and this is a functionally significant response. It, it results in tumor lysis. And she went on to understand what is the mechanism of this, and she showed in fact uh, that the bortezomib triggers DNA damage, that this actually as a consequence uh, triggers a signaling IRF3 TBK sting gas signaling or gas sting signaling and in fact that you have uh, a signature and that signature very much mirrors the signature of immunogenic cell death both in patients in our clinical experience and in her mouse models. So the question is, can we restore immunogenic cell death in someone who doesn't have it? And so this data suggests that potentially you could use sting agonists that also induce a signature. It's a type 1 interferon response, uh, and potentially do so in myeloma. But what I think is very exciting, and this is yet unpublished, but she went on to say, what is the role of immunogenic cell death in terms of clinical outcomes? So she looked at patients who really didn't have a good outcome, very short-term survival in our DFCIIFM experience versus those who had a longer. 
and she looked at those genes in those groups compared to the genes uh, that characterized immunogenic cell death. And she came out with a gene and a protein called GAPARAP that seemed to be important in immunogenic cell death. And there's a lot of data, but I'm just going to show one of her cartoons. On the top, what I've said is that bortezomib induces immunogenic cell death. It's killing the cell, and you have, as a consequence, mobilization of, of a, a eat me signal called calreticulum on the cell surface, dendritic cell uptake, an immune response, and obviously subsequent autophagy. On the bottom is the high risk multiple myeloma. Uh, that, that is, Gaparap, this gene and protein that she identified, it's encoded on chromosome 17P, which you all know is, is high-risk disease in myeloma and other, disease, other cancers, arguably other blood cancers, but also even solid tumors. But what happens in that context at the bottom here is bortezomib, again, uh, kills the myeloma cell, but there's no mobilization of cal reticulum because it's retained actually in mitochondria by uh, something called staniocalcin. And so there's no immunogenic cell death induced. So this is one idea that maybe you could inhibit uh, staniocalcin and allow that mobilization to occur in immunogenic cell death. But she has very many other ideas, including currently available drugs that might be available, that might possibly restore immunogenic cell death in those patients who don't have it. So in my view, this is really important, not only in myeloma, but potentially in patients who have high risk disease otherwise. So stay tuned. Another uh, issue that I just want to bring up, you all probably know that we published recently RVD, with or without stem cell transplant in the New England Journal this summer, Paul Richardson in particular, and it showed that in fact progression-free survival was extended almost two years by the use of transplant. It also confirmed further that MRD negativity was important. But for today, what I wanted to say is that the impact of therapy that maybe isn't as recognized as it could be, as I just showed you for bortezomib, in melphalan here, uh, we've all known that melphalan is mutagenic. But what this one slide shows you is before and after relapse of multiple myeloma cells, whether they got RVD or RVD and transplant. And the only quick point I want to make here is that there are more neoantigens expressed. There's many more mutations with the melphalan, but there's many more neoantigens. And it may be that responsiveness to image post-transplant or even other now novel immune therapies may be enhanced. We know that checkpoint inhibitors responses is much higher in high mutational burden. So it may be possible that we're doing this in an unknowing way already. Now, what about the image? We've known for a long time that the imids worked on the microenvironment. This is a cartoon that was originally a hallucination in 1999 when it was published, but it's been uh, actually validated in multiple studies over the years. Then you know this, there's direct killing with caspase 8 mediated apoptosis, there's inhibition of cytokines, inhibition of adhesion, inhibition of angiogenesis, we just heard such a nice talk, and they're called immunomodulatory because they activate T cells, NK cells, and KT cells, and they downregulate regulatory C cells in patients, and we and others in this room have shown all of that to be true in the clinic. So the issue is we didn't learn, this was, that was around 2000, we didn't learn until 15 years later the really underlying mechanism of this honestly similar to what we just showed with bortezomib. And as you all know, it's cerebellum binding and subsequent triggering of degradation of Icarus 1 and 3, both in the tumor cell on the left and in the immune cells on the right, both NK cells and T cells. You know that this is led, as is shown on the right, to the new stronger cell mods that have a higher affinity and stability of binding to cerebellum, so they're working when pomalidomide doesn't. That's what's shown in the left here. Those are called molecular glues because all the imids and the cell mods, they bind to cerebellum and they just change the affinity for the substrate Icarose 1 and 3, higher affinity with the latter compounds. But it's led to a whole new class of drugs that's shown on the right called bifunctional uh, uh, heterodimer binders. They're called degronomids or protax, but the point is they exploit this mechanism, bind to cerebellum, 
they put a ubiquitin tag because there's a covalent link to the substrate you want to degrade. And these have gone forward, as you all know, binding to the estrogen receptor in breast cancer, androgen receptor in prostate cancer with early promising findings. This is also going to happen in myeloma. The substrates that we've been studying are 2, BRD9, and uh, RAF. And I'll just show you one example here. So BRD9, I believe, could be a nice epigenetic target in multiple myeloma. Why are we interested? BRD9 is more expressed in myeloma than normal. It has prognostic significance. If you look at the DEP map, it actually there is dependence uh, on our BRD9 for myeloma cell growth. And in the upper right, if you knock it down with SH, uh, myeloma cell lines actually are inhibited in their growth. And in the lower left, if you use a BRD9 degrader that's selective, for doesn't degrade other bromo domains, it in fact inhibits patient cell growth uh, in the laboratory and then on the right lower in an animal model. So this we think is very important. It works as we subsequently learned by impacting, again, ribosomogenesis. If you knock down BRD9, you get a depletion of ribosome-related genes, which are correlated in myeloma with BRD9 expression. Again, ribosome signatures are higher in myeloma than normal and have prognostic significance. So the degrader that uh, we are using does, in fact, deplete ribosomogenesis genes. And I'm proud to say there's a BRD9, there's two of them actually in the clinic. The one we're using is, is uh, have been involved with is an oral degrader in the clinic that's very well tolerated. It's going forward in sarcoma first, but uh, hopefully uh, based on this data, we can get it into myeloma soon as well. In the theme that you've heard about this morning of the microenvironment and also further targeting protein uh, synthesis, in the bone marrow microenvironment, there are very high concentrations of proline. They actually go up with the progression disease. And what's shown on this slide, in a proline-rich microenvironment, the, there is a glutamyl proline tRNA synthetase, aka EPRS, uh, that results in um, ligation of glutamic acid, or proline in this case, to cognate T transfer RNAs that augment protein translation and synthesis. So we've been involved in a prototype inhibitor called NCP26. NPCP26 blocks this process, so it stops protein translation. And on the right-hand side of this slide, it triggers amino acid starvation, cell cycle arrest, and in vivo growth emission of myeloma cells in our microenvironmental, in our model systems. And we're working towards now translating this towards a clinically active agent, but we think it's going to be another way Proteasome inhibitor was the first for protein homeostasis targeting. Then the second I just mentioned would be maybe targeting ribosomogenesis. This would be a third one, potentially to target translation. And one quick slide about the microenvironment. You've heard great talks um, from Bruno, Nicola, and others here this morning already, but the point is, when myeloma cells bind with stroma, we've been focused, in particular, Darminder Chauhan and his colleagues, on the plasmacytic dendritic cell. The cartoon on the right shows you when a myeloma cell binds to a plasmacytic dendritic cell, CD73 is upregulated on both of the partners. And on the left-hand side, what CD73 is, it's an enzyme that converts AMP to adenosine. And many of you may know that adenosine is immunosuppressive in the bone marrow microenvironment. It actually uh, suppresses uh, CD8 positive T cells and NK cells, which bear adenosine receptors. I'm not showing you the data, but we did show that if you inhibit CD73 with antibody or an oral inhibitor, you can overcome this immunosuppression. And as we're sitting here this morning, there is a clinical trial in multiple myeloma targeting this the consequences of this interaction. So I'm really focused on the, the crosstalk and the potential clinical relevance uh, that it, it can uh, show us. Now, I mentioned at the start, I'm going to talk about targeted therapies. And in my view, we haven't been very successful in myeloma 
at targeted therapy, certainly not as much as some of our solid tumor colleagues. So this shows you the one success story, in my opinion, and you all know it, but I'll just remind you that there's a subset of myeloma cells that overexpress BCL2 gene and protein. It's 1114 translocation, but it's beyond that as well. But in that subset, if you use venetoclax already approved in leukemia and lymphoma, together with a proteasome inhibitor on the left-hand side here, you get a marked increase in progression-free survival that's really restricted to the BCL2 overexpressing patients. That's kind of our only success story, and it's not yet regulatory approved. We're hoping that it will be. But we've been focused on targeted therapies to try to be, uh, again, in the context of relapse myeloma, to try to overcome mechanisms of resistance underlying relapse. So we did a crispr cas screen here that's shown in the upper left that identified a gene and protein called TRAF2 that regulates imid sensitivity, in particular pomalidomide sensitivity. It turns out in the lower left that if you inhibit or knock out TRAF2, that results in upregulation of two signaling pathways, ERK activation and alternative pathway of NF-kappa B, non-canonical pathway. On the right-hand side, if you use an ERK inhibitor, even in this TRAF2 knockout resistant to pomalidomide cell, you can restore sensitivity. So an ERK inhibitor or a MEK inhibitor, which we have in the clinic for other diseases, could be used in this context to restore sensitivity in vitro on the top and in the lower right in vivo to uh, pomalidomide in this example. But this morning, we're talking a lot about the microenvironment, and that mechanism is also true in the microenvironment. This slide shows you on the top that bone marrow stromal supernatant downregulates TRAF2. It upregulates in the upper right the same signaling pathway, in this case, ERK1 and 2. And the bottom of this slide shows you that you can, in the context of bone marrow supernatant or even interleukin 6, you can add in a ERK MEK inhibitor and overcome the resistance that's conferred by the microenvironment. You know, we don't think about this that very much, but we really need to think about what are the underlying mechanisms related to the microenvironment. Paula and others told you beautifully about the T cell side, but what about the signaling that is induced in myeloma cells as a consequence of where the microenvironment is, where we really need to successfully target these cells. Another example is the CD38. You know, we have isotuximab, we have daratumumab, and we use them, and unfortunately, patients do get resistant. But what this slide shows you is, on the left, four different myeloma cell lines in the presence or absence of bone marrow supernatant. And it turns out bone marrow supernatant downregulates CD38 expression. It's actually on the right related to a decrease in transcription. What is the underlying mechanism? It turns out that it's a STAT3, uh, STAT1 mechanism as shown here. If you look at in the presence of supernatant or IL-6, you get activation of STAT1 and STAT3. So we reasoned and in, in, in the context of CD38 downregulation, so we reasoned we could inhibit that with a JAK inhibitor. So this slide shows you on the left that if you add ruxolitinib, a JAK inhibitor, you can abrogate that STAT activation, and on the right at the top, if in the presence of bone marrow supernatant, adding in ruxolitinib, you can restore CD38 expression on the top, and on the bottom, you can restore ADCC. So this suggests that this might be a mechanism of uh, uh, upregulating CD38. And in very recent unpublished data by um, Dr. Liu and our group, He's looked at epigenetic changes. So KDM6A, which is a demethylase uh, in multiple myeloma, uh, he studied and is a target for regulating CD38 expression. What's shown on this slide, if on the up the top, if you knock down KDM6A, um, you have increased uh, methylation here on the promoter of CD38 and CD48, which is a receptor on tumor cells for NK cells. And consequently, what I'm showing you in one cartoon, if you use an inhibitor of KDM6A, 
you can, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you, if you use an EZH2 inhibitor, you can enhance KDM68 activity. You can get rid of this methylation on both the CD38 promoter and upregulate it, and also on the CD48 promoter and upregulate NK cell activity. That's what's shown you in the lower right, and so you get an increase of ADCC. So this might be an example of an epigenetic inhibitor that can infect the target, but maybe even more generally improve NK cell killing of tumor cells more broadly than this just antigen. So the point I'm trying to make is I think we can really study targeted therapies. We haven't been that successful in, in isolating the tumor cell, but in fact, studying the underlying mechanisms of resistance for our treatments may offer a new opportunity. And then finally, just to talk, you're going to hear other talks at length about this, but CAR T cells, we've been blessed in myeloma to have two of them FDA approved. Our, our center with Nikhil Munchi led the uh, approval in the United States of Ida cell, and you know about Silta cell. Well, all both of them, as you're going to hear from others, are going forward now in earlier clinical trials, and hopefully, and it is likely that they'll get better results that are, uh, than they've even gotten so far. But I would argue with you or posit that they're not very practical, at least in our setting. We're having trouble getting adequate access to the, you know, the need is far outweighs the supply. Um, and the logistical challenges of getting the patient, getting the cells harvested, waiting three or four weeks, making sure the myeloma is under control, the sun, the moon, the stars all have to line up in order to get this done. So we've been trying to see if we can't make it a more practical, um, broadly uh, uh, usable technology. And one example is shown here. This is the idea that you can make CAR T cells literally overnight. And instead of expanding them with CD3, CD28, and, and other culture conditions ex vivo, and we really literally need 450 million of these cells that are figuratively and literally exhausted, why not put in very small numbers of cells on the left, like 2 million cells, 5 million cells, 10 million cells, and let them expand in vivo? And they do, which is shown on the right here, and it's a selection from early lineage memory T cells, but we're seeing some very promising results. I like it scientifically, but I also like it practically because it might make it more readily available to our patients who really need it. We've also been involved in making RNA CAR T cells. Um, the consequence of this is you use RNA instead of DNA, so the transcript is expressed very short time, nine or 12 days, and you can give these RNA CARs repeatedly over time. And that's been done in relapsed myeloma. It's now being done in newly diagnosed myeloma. They're very well uh, tolerated, and we'll see whether this is another approach that might make it very um, more readily available. From our center, Eric Smith recently published in the New England Journal that there are other targets for CAR T cells, and the one he's focused on is GPRC5D. On the left, you can see in the red there, it's expressed pretty strongly relative to, in myeloma relative to other cancers. It is on hair follicles, but not many other uh, normal cells. In this dose escalation trial that he just published in the New England Journal, there were high response rates at the uh, dose that was chosen, but importantly, there were responses even in patients in, uh, in the red lower right who had had prior CAR T cell therapy. And we're going to need to have these agents available given the panoply of BCMA agents that are now here with bites and immunotoxins and CAR T cells. What about life? in patients whose myeloma relapses after BCMA therapy. And one of my favorites, which is not in the clinic, but it's really strong in the preclinical data right now, are what's called binary activated T cell with chimeric antigen receptors, aka BAT, BAT cars. Um, and the traditional construct is shown on the left with co-stimulatory molecules, the SCFV, as you know. But on the right, it's an indirect CAR. So what this means is you have the co-stimulatory molecules, but in this case, the, uh, anti, the SCFV binds, antibody binds to some labeled protein. We've done fluorescein or other proteins. And the point would be in multiple myeloma, for example, you could give daratumumab or elatuzumab and label the myeloma cells in patients. 
the antibodies would be labeled, we'll just say, with protein X. Then you could give these bad cars, which would be activated in small numbers, you'd get them, but they'd only be activated in vivo, in the patient, when they bound to protein X. And in fact, this allows you to use low amounts of antibody, low amounts of CAR T cells. You can target more than one antigen at a sign. We now have signaling. We have switches in there that uh, you might postulate would enhance their activity. Uh, and so very exciting, and most exciting to me is, again, trying to think about how this can be more universally utilized. You could use this with antibodies and HER2 new and breast cancer or you, your favorite disease. So hopefully this will translate to the clinic soon. Allogeneic cars, I think, do have great potential. I'm not going to cover it in, in detail, but they're off the shelf. Most of the studies to date have dealt with graft-versus-host disease, but in fact, rejection remains a major issue, but this is very promising. And then CAR T cells, I'm sorry, CAR NK cells, I think, are very promising because you don't need to have any matching. You can make large numbers from a single donor. You can use them repeatedly. And uh, so exciting new data that's ongoing in myeloma and other settings. The final point I'm going to make is what about the bispecific you know, T cell engagers? You're going to hear from Hans uh, in a minute a total talk about this. But last yesterday, this was FDA approved in the United States. That's uh, in the next to the right column there, teclistamab, 62% uh, activity you know, persisting for 66% of patients for at least nine months. Uh, it does have some neurotoxicity, so it's only going to be prescribed under a REMS program in the United States, but it's clearly the first one. Uh, uh, now, it was first by the EMEA in Europe and now in the United States. GPRC5D, just like in the CAR T cells, has been translated in bytes too, and this is an up-to-dated slide of the data. The only point I'll make is that there is activity of this bite in patients who have already had myeloma relapse after BCMA therapy. So just like the CAR T cells work, so do the bites. And finally, I think the future in the, in the off-the-shelf uh, constructs here is in tri-specific or more antibodies. Right now, the, the bites don't have co-stimulatory molecules in general. Why not? They should. They could target more than one antigen. They could actually be T or NK cell uh, tri-specific uh, bites uh, and uh, constructs as well. So I think the future here, teclistamab is only the first generation. I think you're going to be a lot more. And, and so what I've tried to say is that I do think we're going to be profiling the tumor in its microenvironment, I tried to tell you about that adverse stromal index concept. We need going to do it at diagnosis and during the disease. I reminded you we can already get MRD negativity in the majority of patients with quadruplet therapy. And what I think is already happening and will happen in the future is we'll use that induction. We'll use CARs and or Ts with the view of trying to get immune memory in our patients, and we're going to need to treat people in a smart way so they actually have a persistent memory. The way we use bites right now, in, continuously, we result in T-cell exhaustion. That's not correct. We're going to need to use some way of measuring immunity that allows us to have persistent immunity. And if we can do this, we're going to achieve what's at the bottom, long-term disease-free survival and potential cure using this approach and if it's possible, these patients will then be free of disease and off all therapy. My final slide is this. I've been doing myeloma for over four decades. The first patient that I was privileged to, ha uh, to have an autologous transplant uh, was in 1986. Some of you in this room were not probably born at that time. But in any event, uh, this was a physician, uh, an orthopedic surgeon who specialized in the foot. And uh, anyway, she got a transplant at our center. She wrote a book about her experience called Going for the Cure. And she and I used to go and speak together. I would talk about myeloma, and she would talk about bone complications from myeloma. But anyway, one time when we were together, and uh, someone in the audience at our talk said to her, Francesca, you have written a book about going for the cure about your transplant. How are you going to know that you're cured? And she made a very prescient comment, in my opinion. She said, cure is growing old and dying from something else. 
So I would make a uh, posit that that's actually occurring today, largely to the efforts of all of you in this room. And from the future, it's going to be more and more common as we together make the science count for patients. Thanks very much.